Welcome to Wildlife Outdoors with your host, Russell and Jose. If you have a passion for conservation of the outdoors, or you're enjoying a calming hike in the mountains, an exhilarating kayak trip on the river, feeling a fish on the end of your line, cooking on an open flame in a primitive campsite, or stalking big game, just waiting for the perfect shot, you're in the right place. So put on your boots and polarized sunglasses and come along for the ride. Howdy, guys, and welcome back to another episode of the Wildlife Outdoor Podcast. Uh, today, it's just Russell and I. We're doing a quick little snapshot episode over cicadas. Um, fun fact, I actually know absolutely nothing about cicadas, but Ru- <laughs> Russell has been doing quite a bit of quite a bit of research, and uh, he's pretty excited to share what he found um, with everybody considering the cicada hatches upon us, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so I'll kick it over to you, Russell. And uh, yeah, man, let's let's uh, share some fun facts. Yeah, man, it's going to be a uh, a pretty interesting late spring, early summer through uh, a lot of the U.S. It's uh, it, it doesn't happen very often, but there is going to be two periodical cicada hatches at the same time, um, which are going to be a 17 year brood and a 13 year brood. Uh, which is going to be brood 19 and brood 13. Oddly enough, brood 13 is a 17 year strain. So okay. it kind of gets okay. a little convoluted there. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I, I, I have to interrupt. Sorry, I don't mean to, but <laughs> I, okay. So what do you mean by broods and the different numbers associated with them? So there are different, uh, I guess, groups. So they're numbered broods and there are, are like 15 active broods right now. Uh, 12 active broods of 17 years and three active broods of 13 years. So basically what it means is the cicadas stay in a larval stage for 17 or 13 years, which before I started doing research, I just thought like eggs would hatch or whatever. Like I didn't know much about it. I was like, oh, they just come every 13 or 17 years. And uh, no, they're in a larval stage for that long. So a 17 year brood is in a larval stage for 17 years before they hatch and so they go from that larval stage they climb trees fences and so everybody's seen the little hollow husks of cicadas when they hatch um that's then transitioning from larval stage to adult stage and then they're an adult for a season so it's crazy to think about that they're living underground eating roots of shrubs and trees and stuff like that for 17 years or 13 years so hold on so they're in a larval stage for that long and then their adult life cycle is a year (laughs) <laughs> Dude, what the heck? <laughs> kind of sucks, could you, right? <laughs> could you imagine, like, like us? We live thirteen years as babies, and then we automatically, like, one day we wake up, we're an adult, and then we live for like a year, and then we're dead. That's Dude, that would wild. Suck. <laughs> that would suck. <laughs> but yeah, that's how it is for them. Um, and of insane. course, there is the annual cicadas as well. So uh-huh. these are the cicadas. the The periodical ones are the ones that are black with red eyes. You'll see a little bit of brown on them. Um, those are the cicadas we're talking about here. The other cicadas, the green ones that you see every year, those are called annual cicadas, or a lot of people call them dog day cicadas. And those are ones that are just constantly going off spring and summertime. And those come every year. So um, slightly different, but basically the same bug. Um, they look different and whatnot. So like if you see flies that are tied in cicada patterns for areas and times when there's going to be a brood hatch, normally they're tying darker colors. But if you want to tie a cicada pattern, That's for like an every year cicada, dog day cicada, it's just going to be green. Um, So that's Mm -hmm. how you can tell the difference between the annual and the periodical. Um, But this year is a special year where we're going to have two broods hatching at the same time, one of which is the largest brood, which is brood 19. And um, they're going to be all over Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, Louisiana, Missouri, Mississippi, North Carolina, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Tennessee, Virginia, a little bit in the Texas panhandle. Like they're going to be everywhere and so a lot of people are thinking oh well there's going to be cicadas because there's two broods unfortunately that's not the case so there are going to be two broods but the second brood is a a 17 year brood it's brood 13 and they're mainly going to be in the midwest so they're going to be iowa illinois wisconsin possibly michigan um but majority of them are going to be illinois illinois is ground zero for both brood 19 and brood brood 13 hatching at the same time so they're going to have millions, billions even, possibly trillions of cicadas hatching, uh, not in Illinois, but in total this year. Yeah. Dude, that's interesting. I got, okay, I got a few different questions. So the broods, are they based on regions? Like, 
you you mentioned yes. a lot was in the south. So are there other regions for like Pacific Northwest and whatever? I haven't seen any in the Pacific Northwest. Um, it seems like most cicadas are from the center of the U.S. towards the east coast. Um, mm. So mm. it's majority from the south, southeast to the northeast and kind of towards like, you know, Illinois and, and Michigan mm -hmm. and then kind of more towards the Midwest. Um, I didn't see too many broods that extended out further West um, in the map that I saw. So they are regional, um, but some of the regions overlap. And that's when you get, you know, Illinois, for instance, this year with 13 and 19 hatching. So what does that mean for, I guess, for a, uh, for the average person, like what should they expect? And then I know You're there's a lot, hear of people a lot probably, of noise. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, yeah. So like, I know there's a lot of people like kind of freaking out, like, I don't know, making it this huge deal, but is right. it one is, do you think it's really as big of a deal as people make it out to be? And then what does that mean for like the fishermen? Cause I've, I, I've seen a lot of people in the fly fishing group, groups, like freaking out saying how this year is going to be epic for fishing and stuff. So what does that yeah. all mean? So for human interaction, from everything that I've seen, is it's not going to make too much of a difference. I mean, cicadas are non-toxic to humans. Um, they don't bite. They're not going to kill anybody. They're not going to make anybody sick. Um, it, in terms of human interaction, it's just going to be loud. Like, you're just going to hear a bunch of buzzing, basically. Um, so it's not going to be too bad. When it comes to fishermen, in areas where there's a, a large population of cicadas, that's going to be the food. So you know what the fish are going to be eating. And as a fly fisherman, there's nothing better than a good topwater take. So if you know cicadas are in the area and they're falling on top of the water and you're throwing a cicada pattern, I mean, you know, you're going to get some topwater takes. So that's always going to be exciting. Um, so it's kind of more of, you know, matching the hatch. You kind of know what's going to be there because you know that this brood is going to hatch here. Um, so it wouldn't hurt to have some cicada patterns in your box, but um, it doesn't really make too much of a difference. It's not going to make a huge impact on everyday life for most people. Um, yeah. It's weird, though, how it kind of like looking historically, I guess they started collecting data about 200 years ago, um, you know, studying around the broods of cicadas and whatnot. And it's weird how it almost seems the year before the cicadas are going to hatch in a, in a region, the bird populations are lower. And so hmm. they haven't exactly found out why cicadas only hatch or, or go from larval stage to adult stage every 13 or 17 years for said brood. Um, they haven't, they haven't figured out why they just know it's a part of their life cycle and they've started to realize that there are actually other conditions that go into it. Bird populations dropped the year before and stuff like that. So it's pretty interesting to see how it's all, you know, intertwined, kind of like how Steve said last week, how everything, you know, goes together. Um, but there's all these fluctuations in populations of other animals, whether they be, they be predators or seemingly unrelated to the to cicada populations, um, how they kind of seem to ebb and flow in the same pattern as cicadas do. So it's pretty interesting. So it makes a big difference on the animal kingdom. Um, but in terms of human interaction, it's, it's not going to make, you know, anything crazy for anybody. Dude, that's so interesting, man. I, yeah, the bird, the fact that the bird populations are lower before they hatch, I wonder what it looks like after if they're just, if they just kind of like swarm, if they can feel like, or assess those changes. Yeah. And that, that's what they were thinking originally is they were thinking that the cicadas could tell and then they would hatch. But now they're starting to see that normally what happens is it just seems like the bird populations are naturally going through their ebbs and flows and the cicadas over time, over the past, you know, millennia, they have, you know, realized that, their populations do better, you know, natural selection, their populations do better when they hatch at these certain times when bird populations are in the low. Um, so I don't think it's anything that's uh, a cognitive thing with the skaters. They're like, oh, there's less birds, let's hatch. It's just kind of something over the years that has just kind of, you know, gone through the the cycle. Mm. That's pretty cool, man. So have you, yeah. in, in your research, have you come across anything about a cicada, a cicada hatch may be affecting like farmers and, and crop damage and things like that. I didn't look into agriculture. I'm sure that there has to be, you know, something because I know that when they're in their larval stage, they'll eat, you know, root balls of, of shrubbery. Um, in the adult stages, I would assume that they would probably eat plants or foliage uh, above ground. So um, I would assume in areas where there's high populations of them, they probably will have some agricultural effects, but I didn't look anything up specifically for that. I was, uh, 
you know, looking more into fishing stuff just because I'm like, hmm, should I tie up some cicada <laughs> patterns? <laughs> so I guess to that end, did you come across any cicada patterns? Like, yeah, there's there's a few. So um, I've seen seen quite a few different ones, and there's you know some very similar to like a Dito popper, um, where you just kind of use some two or three millimeter foam, double them up, fold them over, tie them down type of thing. I've seen some real intricate ones to where you'll do actually do foam wraps, different colors, uh, you know, put some ribbing on it, add legs, add wings. I've seen, you know, just typical polyfiber wings. I've seen some actual, like, they look like real cicada wings. Um, some people taking, uh, bead headed pins and put them on the side to look like the red eyes. Like, there's some real intricate patterns out there. And then there's some basically guide fly patterns out there. Um, but I'm sure they all, they all do the job, you know? <laughs> yeah, dude. I I've seen some videos on Instagram of, I, I can't, I can't think of their, their names now, but dude, they were tying some really awesome ones. Like they looked so good. And then I tried to tie one using deer hair. And it it was just it was terrible. I just I just got mad and I just <laughs> took a razor blade and cut it off the hook because it just looked so bad, which is unfortunate. That was a waste of a waste of material. But um, yeah, I've never actually aside from that one deer hair cicada, I've never actually tried to tie a cicada. But I feel like I feel like I should, especially if this year being the year, then I probably definitely should. As should a right. lot of you guys who are planning on going on fishing the cicada hatch. I, I tried to tie one up and uh, so I don't know if you remember, I, I posted a picture of a woolly bugger I tied probably like a week or two ago. Um, uh, yes. That was like my second fly because I was so pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> I was getting so angry. I have not tied, well, other than with iron fly. Um, I hadn't tied prior to that in a few years. And so mm -hmm. uh, I tied a woolly bugger and then a Frankenstein of a fly at iron fly. And then the other night, a couple weeks ago I was like, Oh, I'm going to try to tie up a cicada pattern. And dude, it came out horrible. <laughs> I was trying to, to my defense, I was trying to make an intricate one and I just couldn't do it. And they didn't have, um, the foam that I wanted at Hobby Lobby. And so I just got some other foam that I thought could make it work. And it just, it wasn't turning out well at all. And so, um, I got a little aggravated and, I cut everything off the hook and said, screw it. I'm going to change the hook. And I'm going to tie a freaking woolly bugger so I can at least put a picture on the website. <laughs> like, <laughs> dude, it was ugly. I should have taken a picture of it to make fun of myself because, dude, it was ugly. Like, I, a fish may have, but may have bit it. I, I probably could have yeah. caught some type of bluegill on it, but yeah, not, not a picky fish. <laughs> it, I, I, I don't know, man. Like, I feel that fish really aren't as, well, Within reason, I think trout can be very, very picky. And so can like the bigger yep. bass and stuff. But I think within reason, I really don't think they care at times. Like, dude, I went fishing with a friend one time. Uh, I wasn't fly fishing, but he threw a bear hook one time and caught a bass. Like literally caught a bass on a bear hook. So, I, and, and then we uh, we ran out of bait one time fishing and I and we just had like some gum. So we put gum on a hook and we were catching fish off that thing. So I really don't yeah. think, and then if, and then if you look at like Bass Pro and you walk through the uh, through the conventional stuff, I mean they caught all kinds of crazy stuff, crazy colors, big, small, don't matter. I really don't think fish care uh, a lot of the time. There are instances like maybe where it's super pressured or very clear waters and things like yeah. that, where or if they're if they're keying in on like something specific, like trout keying in on a hatch or something, they're you know. Mm -hmm. Has to, it has to look a certain way or ride a certain way or, you know, present itself in a certain way. I think in those yeah. instances, I think it makes a big difference. But I've seen, I mean, I've tied some like horrendous flies and I can go kill some, <laughs> like just kill it in the, in, the, in the pond next door. So, I mean, it's, yeah. I don't know, it's, it's funny. Fight fish are funny that way, I guess. I've tied some pretty bad flies and caught some fish. The hell, you remember that one time we were out there at the, um, some body of water in central Texas and we ran out of bait. Back when we were conventional fishermen. Oh, a, yes, a yes. <laughs> I caught a, a good-sized catfish on a dip. Instantaneous. Yep. Like, yeah, That just had to be the smell. <laughs> that or, or that or it just happened to be passing by right when you dropped it in the water. Right. I don't, I don't know. Because it was like it was like instant. It was wild. Yep. The second it hit the water. <laughs> Dude, did I tell you about the time that Adeline caught a fish uh, on a bear hook? No, I don't think you have. Dude, so this was probably... I don't know, maybe two years ago or so. 
And um, I went out to my buddy Matt's aunt's house, and she lives over off the lake here in, in Hot Springs. And uh, he's like, yeah, man, we're just going to sit. And her her backyard goes up to the water. He's like, we're just going to sit in the backyard and, you know, maybe cook some hot dogs, drink some beer and fish. I said, all right. And so we went over there, and it was him. My, it was my buddy Matt, his cousin Mike, um, his son, me, and Adeline. And Adeline was, you know, what, three, four at the time. And she had this little Moana push button rod and reel. And Matt was using worms. He was using chicken liver. He was using hot dogs. He was using all sorts of stuff, live bait or, or like bait. And then he started throwing like Cinco's and rattle traps, buzz baits, crank baits, like throwing all these other, uh, you know, conventional fishing gear, just trying to get something, not catching anything. I was throwing every fly I had in my box and was not catching anything, not a bluegill not bass nothing not seeing any and i've seen white bass run through there and it was around that time of year too and just i mean nothing well adeline had gotten restless she was out there for 30 minutes or so gotten restless had gone inside and was playing inside we're on like 11 o'clock at night like i let her stay up late she came out at 11 o'clock at night and wanted a fish by that point we'd already used all the worms and everything and i said all right cool and so i figured she just wanted to be out there with me so i threw her bobber out there with a bear hook 11 o'clock at night and we're just standing there talking and Adeline goes, daddy, I got one. And I thought she was hung up on something, you know? And I, cause I, I was like, I just threw a bear hook out there and she starts reeling and like drag is peeling on her little rod. And I look and the end of it's bouncing and I'm like, what the heck? So I helped her reel it in and she caught this huge freaking slab of a, of a bluegill. And, uh, I was like, how in the heck? Like we've been out here for four or five hours using everything we have to catch anything. Haven't caught anything. And then she catches it on a bear hook. Like, come on now. <laughs> Dude, that's wild. Dude, it was nuts. I was it was acorns. <laughs> but uh <laughs> dude, I remember this one time. Uh I was so my buddy when when so when I was doing my master's down um at the call at uh I guess in South Texas, I had some friends and one of them had a um a house near the coast. I mean it was like on the coast. It was in it was near it was like on Baffin Bay. And it had a private, it had a private pier. He always told me, he's like, yeah, man, if you ever want to go out there fish anytime, you know, just let me know or whatever. And every Wednesday we would also go to his place. And it was like, kind of like family night where we would take turns um, bringing food or cooking food. And we all just, it was a few of us. We'd all sit there and have dinner and then we'd go, we'd go fishing afterwards. So this was one of those nights we all went, we all went out there, we had dinner and then we were just kind of hanging around talking and we went fishing and uh, the bike got really, really slow and it was getting really, really late. So everybody kind of went inside. But my buddy who who owned the place, he's like, yeah, man, you know, just, you know, you, you can stay out here as long as you want. I really don't care. Just um, just turn the pier lights off when you leave. It's like, all right, cool. So I just, I stayed out there, man. And I had it was one of the first times that I was really trying to learn how to fly fish. And it was one of the one of the first times I took my fly rod to the pier to go like go fishing. And before that, I had been using it while everybody else was using conventional gear and they were like out fishing me like 10 to one, you know, I think I maybe caught one or two fish while, while I was out there. And so for, I ended up putting the fly rod away, just picked up the conventional stuff and started catching fish, whatever, but they went away. And so I just stayed out, stayed out there. I was really trying to practice my cast and I had this little, I don't even know what to call it. I guess it was like a shrimp imitation. I'm not really sure, but it had a bunch of little rubber legs. It had some chenille. It's very, very simple. Like it wasn't overly extravagant. I, I bought it off eBay, I think, for like, I don't know, three bucks for like five of them. And so it was very, very cheap. That's how I used to buy my flies when I was first getting into it because, you know, that was cheap and I really didn't yeah. know what I was doing or anything. So I just, I just, I just bought those. So I had like these little weird little rubber legs. I had some chenille, very simple. So I started using that and dude, I don't know what happened, but the, the, the bite just turned on. I was cleaning up. I probably by myself that night caught, I don't know, easily over 50 fish, dude. It That's was, in, nuts. it was insane. Just, I mean, and then some keeper trout, uh, speckle trout, sorry, not rainbows or brown speckle trout and, um, a bunch of like undersized, but dude, by the end, I mean, like by the end of it, this, it was essentially like a bear hook. It had lost all its rubber legs. <laughs> the chenille was like barely there. It still had the little, the, the dumbbell eyes. But dude, for whatever reason, the fish did not care. They were just smacking that thing. It was awesome. Eventually, I just retired the fly 
and I got I got tired, so I just I just put it up while the while the getting was good, and I just went out the pier, turned off the lights, went home. But dude, it was one of the most epic nights of fishing I've ever had. And I was telling my friends about it the next day, like, oh, dude, you're full of crap, and that didn't happen. I was like, bro, I I promise you. And um, <laughs> but yeah, dude, it was it was insane. So like, even though like it's it's the the, the fly started off looking good. By the end of it, man, it was hardly anything, but it was still wrecking it. It was awesome. That's insane. Dude, I've never caught a speckled trout on the fly yet. It's fun, man. It's a lot of fun. Actually, fly fishing, I, I feel like fly fishing, well, it's hard around like the public piers, especially when there's a lot of people around because there's just so many yeah. lines in the water and sometimes the piers get so packed, everyone's together. But every now and again, you'll go out there on a night where there's just not that many. I, I feel like because flies are lighter and typically smaller they work better like i've had some nights where people weren't catching anything and i was just catching fish on my fly rod because it was just different from what everybody else was throwing yeah that's kind of how it was this last july when i was up in alaska you know i went with my brother my brother-in-law and their friend and uh they were all using conventional gear and stuff and i think i outfished them probably i think i caught eight ten fish that night and i think they caught one total between the three of them <laughs> and that was on a lake surprisingly i've never had luck on a lake before <laughs> dude lakes are tough for me man i've i've only i've i've fished the well i've never fished a lake like uh, off a boat or anything with a fly rod i've only ever fished a lake with the with conventional gear but even then man it was just so different i remember my buddy he had just gotten this really nice uh, i think it was a skeeter bass boat and he took me fishing on the lake in austin and uh we found some fish. It, the fishing was really slow, but then it, it, it heated up and it got really, really good. We caught a bunch of bass that day. But then he invited me another time to go to Falcon Lake, which is the biggest lake I've ever fished. And there were some mm-hmm. monster bass in there. Some monster gator guard, too. I've seen some. I saw some huge ones. But, dude, that, like, it was just so different to me, man. Fishing, I mean, like, fishing, like, 30 foot of water. Like, even with a jig, it's just it's just crazy. Like, I just could not figure it out. I did, I think I ended up getting one bite. And then when I set the hook, it broke off. So I'm, at some point, I like nicked my line. And when I set the hook, it was just gone. And um, we did. It was it was tough fishing. We all got skunked. That place was tough for me. Lake fishing, dude. It's just and even big river fishing. I think um, can be really tough for me just because I don't do it a lot. Like when yeah. we went, when we went when we went to the white man, that place was like if if we didn't have a guide, I probably didn't. I wouldn't know what to do or what to look for or nothing. Yeah. Yeah, I I definitely prefer small water myself. I fished a few tournaments in lakes and whatnot, and some of the tournaments that I was fishing there for a while were for uh, Central Arkansas kayak anglers. And um, so there's conventional guys out there, some guys throwing Alabama rigs, and I'm out there with my fly rod. And so it's been tough, you know, going against conventional and freaking Alabama rigs. I mean, hell, can you imagine? So um, I've placed in a couple tournaments, third place, uh, fourth place typically. Third, fourth, fifth are like where I typically stay um we need to get a fly tournament some somehow going because that would be fun to do going against conventional i just uh. <laughs> yeah well you and i have talked about trying to figure out how we can host like fly fishing like one fly tournament or, or multi-species tournament or something we just because uh, yeah. rob i think that was the episode we were we had with rob where he was he was about to go to a i think it was a multi-species tournament yeah we like, in texas that'd be, yeah i'd be like man that'd be cool to make one before like everybody you know like yeah have like all we my should for sure we should definitely get going on that try to get something planned out and do dude that'd be sick it's just the it logistics would. of how it would all work out keeping right, people you have to look at species and where people are yeah. at you know yeah and regionality has a huge impact so yep you know i mean yeah. obviously if we do it in the summertime you're not going to be catching trout in texas but there's areas of arkansas you can catch them so yeah you, know, you wouldn't want to be doing stuff like that we'd probably have to do like a warm water species term tournament in the summer or spring. And then maybe we can well, do a different one for like cold water species in the winter. We could do that or we could do um, each, I guess, fish will have a different weight assigned to it. Like, uh, and yeah. we can go by, I guess, but it'd be hard though. Cause like with region, for example, in a region where rainbow trout are common, like they could have a one or something same yeah. for like largemouth bass. And then I don't know, like a, I don't know, a tarpon could be like five or whatever. And then, yeah i don't know but but then it gets more complicated because of well you'd have to have something equally weighted for instance you're not going to catch tarpon if you're not on the coast so if there's going to be five points for a tarpon we'd have to do five points for 
uh, mirror carp or something that you can catch yeah. somewhere else than the coast. You know, but that's yeah, it's still have difficult to, do a, to catch. And we'd have to do a ton of research. Like, yeah, yeah it was just I don't know. We'll, we'll we can we can out. get something going though. Yeah, we'll figure we'll <laughs> for figure sure. out something. We'll figure something out. Yeah. But uh, yeah, man. So we're coming up at twenty some odd minutes now. We're trying to keep these snapshots short. Um, yeah. So we talked about. A little bit about fly time, cicadas. Uh, any, anything else we should touch on? Um, I would say events, but uh, by the time this episode comes out, the the pickerel tournament is going to be over. They're doing a pickerel tournament. It's Thursday now. This Sunday they're doing a pickerel tournament. I'm not going to be able to go, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, so here in Arkansas. So hopefully those of y'all that did the pickerel tournament that already know about it here in Arkansas, um, I believe on Lower Lake to Gray, hopefully they did a good job, caught some fish. Maybe won a tournament, won some money. I don't know. Um, I'm not going to be able to make it to it, but uh, I think it's going to be the second year in a row I haven't made it to that tournament. And I love yeah. catching me some pickerel. Still need to catch one. Still want to yeah, catch one. Do. There's a place in Texas you can't. But uh, but speaking of events in here in Texas, we have Trout Fest in New Braunfels mm-hmm. this weekend. Uh, I know our buddy, our buddies, Marco and Danny, are going to be there. And, uh, I've seen some posts from some other folks that are going. I don't know if I'm going to be going yet or not. I would like to. Yeah. Maybe I'll make it my homework and report back to this podcast how it all went down. But um, you should. Yeah. When so is it? It's this weekend. So Friday, I think they're having like a banquet or something. And then Saturday, they're having, um, I guess, the actual expo. So they're going to have a bunch of different like different things going on that day. And it's all free, too, which is cool. I think the only things nice. you pay for, obviously, is anything that you buy there. And then um, the tickets for the banquet. And, tic- and they're showing a fly fishing film. Or I don't know if it's a film or a series of films. But they're having like a movie night on f- Saturday evening, if I'm not mistaken. But nice. tickets are already sold out for that, from what I've seen. So I, mm-hmm. if I go, I will not make it to either of those, but I will try to go to the expo on Saturday. And I think Sunday there's some events going on too. Um, I know Danny is going, I think he said. I think he said he's going Friday night for the banquet. I think he's going Sunday. I don't know what day Marco's going, but I might go I might go by and, and check it out because I've never been to Trout Fest. It'd be, it'd be cool. I know uh, – so – for the Honey Hole Hates Trash event, one of the winners, or the winner who won the fly, the the, the hand tied flies from us, I actually met them, gave them the flies. Really cool, really, really, really cool people. And um, I think he said they were going to go. And so I might, it'd be cool to run into them there. And I think, I can't remember who else I'll talk about. There's going to be a lot of people there. So yeah. um, it'd be a really cool event. And unfortunately, whoever's listening to this, the event would have already passed by the time you do. But if anybody is listening to this who attended Trout Fest, we would love to hear uh, what what the experience was like for you guys. You know, so reach out to us and it'd be cool to kind of pass that along for next year in case anybody is is interested in that. Absolutely, isn't Zach Harris going to be there? He's going to be one of the tires there or something like that. Something like that. I feel like I feel like some of the Honey Hole guys are going to be there. I'm not sure though. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I wish I could wish I could make it down. I did I honestly didn't even know it was coming up this weekend. So Yeah, I didn't either. I just saw <laughs> Dude, I, I know I, this whole like I don't know, things have been so crazy here lately. I, I just lost track of all that stuff and I, I saw something about it not too long ago. I was like, Oh, that's cool. I might I might actually be in town for that. So we'll see. Nice. Yes, yeah, sir. Well that'll serious. work. Well we're coming up on half an hour and I guess that's where we're trying to keep the uh the snapshots at, so is there anything else you want to talk about before we close her out? Uh, no, just hope you guys have a good weekend. And uh, thanks again for tuning in. Always a pleasure. And uh, if you have, you know, follow us on socials, Instagram, Facebook, uh, YouTube now as well. Um, TikTok. TikTok. And if you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, any kind of feedback, we'd love to hear from y'all. Um, yeah. So thanks again for tuning in. And uh, just till, till next time. We'll catch y'all next time. This has been Wildlife Outdoors. Thanks for listening. Follow us on Facebook at Wildlife Outdoors and on Instagram at wild.life.outdoors. Let's go live life on the wild side.